everyone, welcome back to the UW Farm. I'm Griffin, AmeriCorps volunteer here and the assistant farm manager. We are at our Center for Urban Horticulture site. As you can see, it's um, much more open, a little more quiet here. There's a path that stretches through the farm and a lot of people like to walk on it. So our farm is very visible to the community helps uh, to educate people about what we're doing here. There's a history to this site at the Center for Urban Horticulture. Uh, if you go back in time, the glacier carved out the Puget Sound region, which is where we are here um, in the Seattle area. The first human inhabitants here were Coast Salish peoples. And right near where the UW farm is, um, to the north, there were approximately five longhouses here and it was a, an established settlement for native peoples. Um, the area where the farm is was partly underwater and was a vibrant uh, part of harvests and foraging and catching fish. There was a fishing weir that was discovered to the west a little bit um, off and near the farm. shortly after the turn of the century. In 1916, Lake Washington, which is just to the south border of the farm, uh, was re-engineered. And there was a cut put through the north side of Lake Washington. It's called the Mont Lake Cut. And that was in the summer of 1916. In the fall of 1916, the Ballard Locks, or Hiram Chittenden Locks, with the Army Corps of Engineers was completed. And the combination of the Montlake Cut and the, um, the locks lowered the lake by 8.8, .8, or approximately nine feet. The lowering of the lake led to an exposure of all this marshland. What that meant is uh, it was an undervalued sort of ecosystem a wetlands. And in the 1920s, the city of Seattle had a dump here. It's called the Montlake Dump. It's also called the Ravenna Dump. And it started on the east side of the UW farm. It was a landfill that sort of migrated across the property over to um, the west of the UW farm and finally was closed in 1971. The University of Washington took over ownership of that city dump. And over the next 20, 30 years, um, in more recent history, has spent a lot of time and effort remediating or healing the land. In 2012, students learned that the original farm site over at the Botany Greenhouse, that that area was going to be, the buildings were going to be demolished, and they were going to lose the original farm site, which was quite small, but really vibrant. They appealed to the university and said, hey, we want the farm to survive. We're looking for another piece of property. And eventually, through a lot of effort and, and, a, and a couple of appeals, the university said, well, there's this property over here. It used to be a landfill. Would you like it? In 2012, uh, that was the first time students came down to this area here. It was mostly grass and pasture. There was a small nonprofit organization activities going on on the east side. Uh, Seattle Tilt, which is now Tilt Alliance, had Seattle Youth Garden Works here, which is a, a youth gardening program. But they actually hired a tractor from Full Circle Farm that came and plowed the soil, but couldn't go too deep because below three feet, we're not allowed to sort of break up the landfill cap. They also had soil testing done, and if you look on the farm in the distance, as you wander around, you see these large yellow posts, and that's for testing groundwater to make sure that it's safe for us to grow food. They spent um, 
uh, five figures to have an elaborate soil test done of the site by a um, geoengineering firm. And it basically tested clean. There's the west, lower, southwest side of the farm. There's some construction debris, so we do not plant there. The rest of the farm, we're just doing annual crops for the most part. And because we're low till or no till, we are not going very deep with any equipment. We soil test every year, if not every other year during COVID, and always watching for the health of the soil and building up. And you see our red bow. I'm Lakota Oglala, and welcome to the Native Garden. So here we plant, um, learn about, and consume traditional foods. Um, this is a focus on indigenous um, plants. Uh, all from all across the Americas. Uh, we have a very diverse indigenous student population here at the university and we aspire to have our um, garden reflect the many different um, tribes people come from as well as um, the many different um, growing methods we use. Um, here you can see we're building four foot mounds. Um, this is a technique used to um, lift the plant's feet out of the water. We're growing um, a three sisters garden, which is corns, beans, and squash. And sometimes we have a fourth sister. Um, this could be tobacco or amaranth. And so this year we'll be planting tobacco along the perimeter here. Um, we also have wapato, which is grown in water. Here we're utilizing um, horse troughs as a way to retain water. And um, these were planted last year and we can see that they're coming back this year. So the plants we grow here um, First Nations, the Native Student Organization, um, one of actually many Native Indigenous student organizations here at the university, will be using this food to feed probably around 200 people, you know, if it's anything like past years. Um, this is an event called Taking Back the Dinner, meant to change the narrative around Thanksgiving and um, allow people to actually engage with Indigenous cultures. Our first started, this was only plot that we had. It was just a small area, but over time the farm has grown a lot and now we have way more plots um, here at the Center for Urban Horticulture location. And what this means is that we can do a big crop rotation. So every season each plot will grow its own type of plant family. So this year this plot is the Hobaceae plant family season by season, we'll rotate them around. So next season, this will have a different kind of plant family growing in it. And that's really good for soil health um, and nutrients in the soil uh, because different plants will be taking or giving specific nutrients from the soil. Hi, we're in our high tunnel right now. We're currently using it as a greenhouse to house our plants that are hardening off or getting acclimated to being outside after you know, being inside in warm temperatures as seedlings. The difference between a high tunnel and a greenhouse is that the greenhouse uh, is climate controlled, so there's heating and cooling if needed. Our high tunnel here does not have any heating or cooling. It's also movable. So in the summer, we'll use this area to grow okra. It's a very hot and humid place in here in the summer. In 2016, these fruit trees were planted as a memorial to um, workers in Washington State who died on the job. So this is a alley, which is a line of fruit trees on the north side of the farm, which is really great. So students get to um, learn about the rosaceae family. So we have apple trees, and then we have a cherry tree, and we have pear trees down on the other end. In the middle of the farm, we also have a polyculture or permaculture patch. That was planted by a student in 2012. So a perennial patch is an example of planting uh, annuals and perennials together, permaculture where there's interactions or synergies. Humphrey planted with apple trees and plum trees, planted with currant bushes, and also an herb spiral. The Center for Urban Horticulture, because of the full sun, we have a lot of flowers here. Both uh, cut flowers that are also edible, but also flowers on the edges of the farm to draw in pollinators. 
and to feed them and have something always blooming all the time. So the apple trees are blooming early, but then later we're gonna have rose bushes and then peonies and then dahlias. Because this is a full sun site, we have a lot more choices here for, for the crops we can grow. One of the things that we do at this site on the UW farm is we have a few different plots where we do research. And so we grow the crops at the farm and then we'll test out how the different treatments affect the yield. You can see we have three different beds here. So this first one was a control and the second two are treated. This is a really good example. You can see this one's a little bit shorter and these two are way taller and we've gotten really heavy harvest yield from this middle one in particular. Other crops that we're doing research with are some peppers, some kale, um, fava beans, edamame, and some acorn squash. At the Center for Urban Horticulture, we also have this wash pack here, um, which is in the middle of our fields. And this is where we take the produce after it has been harvested and we wash it in these sinks which has a dual purpose of cleaning off any dirt or critters that might be on the produce. And it also will rehydrate it so it looks really fresh um, at our retail outlets. The other elements I want to mention are on the perimeter of the farm are hedgerows for pollinators, for wildlife, and its habitat. It's also a little bit of a windbreak, so that's really good to reduce soil erosion. Other thing I want to mention is the super shed, our tool shed, which is sort of the the epicenter of the farm, where we have all our materials and tools for students, the compost toilet, and coming soon is a vermicomposting facility we're really excited about. We'll have livestock, our little red wiggler worms that'll produce this soil amendment. In closing, really at the UW farm, we've inherited this place from people before us, and we are really just the current caretakers of this property and we invite people to come and participate and learn about urban farming and food sustainability and soil and, and the myriad of topics. Um, but really, I'm just here as a facilitator and um, we do grow food, but we are really an educational space primarily.